Welcome to the referendum debate. There's just 10 weeks now until Scotland votes on independence, and tonight we're on the Isle of Skye. On our panel, one politician from each side of the debate, the SNP's Transport Minister, Keith Brown, and Labour's Youth Employment Spokesman in the Scottish Parliament, Jenny Mara. And joining them, the businessman and former chairman of Motherwell Football Club, John Boyle, and one of Scotland's leading actors, David Heyman. In the interest of a good debate, our audience tonight are evenly divided between supporters and opponents of independence, plus some who are undecided. Our audience here have submitted their questions, and our panel have not seen them. Welcome to Portree. Like much of Scotland's jagged western frontier, Skye has seen its share of struggles. From the 19th century, thousands of men, women and children were driven off this land to make way for sheep. The legacy of the clearances remains. The island still worries about losing young talent. But modern Skye has much more to offer than crofting, media, whisky, and tourism are all important industries. And these days, most visitors arrive not by boat, but by this controversial crossing. Politically, Skye is split between the Union and Independence, represented by Liberal Democrats and the SNP. But who will dominate this stunning landscape after September the 18th? Well, let's start the attempt to get to the bottom of that question with our first question tonight, which comes from John Stoddart. Why are both sides so focused on the financial aspects of independence? Is that all they think people care about now? John Boyle. I, as a businessman, obviously I'm concerned for, for economics, but I am absolutely resolute this is not solely about economics at all, and you're quite right to focus on it. I'm, I'm Scottish. Uh, um, I, I live in Scotland. I've chose to headquarter my business in Scotland. Um, my wife's Scottish, two of my children go to Scottish universities, and I yield to no one in my, my love for the country. And I have as much passion for looking after Scotland's interests, um, and I seem to think that the debate has moved in some way that those in the Yes campaign seem to have a monopoly in passion. They don't. This debate is much more than about economics. It's about the next 300 years, having looked at the previous 300 years. And I believe that people will balance, obviously, what's going to happen to our children and our children's children in terms of their economic well-being is crucial, but also how we feel about ourselves, how we see ourselves. I see ourselves as part of a United Kingdom. It's been enormously successful not in everything, but enormously successful for 300 years. And I think that if we divided, it would be to the diminishment of both. So passion and who we are and what we do and where we're going is at the very core of the debate. And I think that is a very good introductory question. But make no mistake about it. Our friends on the Yes campaign do not have a monopoly on passion or concern for this country. Okay. We are looking at it. Well, let's ask them. Let's, uh, let's ask them about that. <laughs> David Heyman, there has been a lot of talk about you know, whether Scotland would be £500 better off or, or, or worse off. People have focused on the financial effects, haven't, haven't they? Isn't there more to it than that? Uh, of course there is, and I applaud the gentleman who asked the question. Thank you very much indeed. It was a very intelligent and very perceptive question. Um, it depresses me no end when I hear it comes down to we're going to be £500 richer or poorer. It's not about that for me. It's not just about the bottom line. The bottom line, of course, is, is, uh, is important, but we do live in a very, very wealthy and rich uh, country uh, with diverse industries, so that is not within question. John, in fact, said he could have been a, a pro-yes spokesman there, actually. It was a very, very profound speech, John. It was great. We could have used the, we could have used the same words. I think it's about what kind of country we wish to live in, what kind of values we wish to hold dear. Um, and I love Native American philosophy, and I read a lot of it. And the Sioux Nation have a very profound proverb which says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I think that's deeply profound. 
So when I'm on my deathbed, I have three sons and I'm going to hand back the planet to my boys. And I say, sorry, guys, um, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a mess, but I was too busy watching X Factor. You know, I didn't think long enough and hard enough about it or about the moral questions. Do we wish to be a country that renounces weapons of mass destruction? Do we wish to be a country that stands up and says, we are a peaceful nation. We will no longer attack another innocent country in our name, on our watch, with our money. Jenny Mara, so much of the Better Together campaign, of which you've been a part, has been about finance, has been about the pound, has been about trade, has been about oil. Mm -hmm. Isn't there more to what Scotland wants for the future than that? I think there's lots of aspects to this debate, but I think John's right to ask this question because, for me, the economy is one of the most important aspects of this debate because actually when you look at it people are concerned about the risks of separating they're concerned about their jobs they're concerned about the impact on their business and these aren't these aren't fanciful concerns these are real concerns about trade with England trade with the rest of the EU um, you know people are concerned about these basic economic questions that are so important for families, for business and for our economy. You know, the SNP have made many promises around this referendum question, but we know that the reality of this and the economic reality of this is that there's either going to have to be tax rises in an independent Scotland or public spending cuts because Alex Salmon's figures just do not add up. And that is why there is so much focus on the economic questions. I'll, I'll give Keith Brown a chance to respond to that in a moment, but let's take a couple of points. The lady in the middle, first of all. Um, I just wanted to make the point that David said that we would be getting rid of weapons of mass destruction and we would be a peaceful country and not attacking other countries. Well, but well Alex that, that would Salmond, certainly be a wish. It's, it's, it's part of my dream, yes. But Alex Salmond is still going to have his own army um, and they're going to be defending the north of the country, you know, the, the North Atlantic or whatever. So we will still be armed and ready, but not just with mass destruction weapons. OK, thank you very much. And the man just behind you. Uh, isn't it the case that the, the political climate in the UK no longer represents the political climate in Scotland. We have a situation... <laughs> I, think, I think people have to look at this issue in the round. We have a situation where there are economic issues, there are also social issues. And we can see what's happening in the rest of the UK in relation to social issues, in relation to welfare. And I don't believe that's the road that the, the, the Scottish electorate want to go down. And I would have to say that we wouldn't be here having this referendum if the Labour Party hadn't ditched its principles many years ago. So thank you. And yes, the man, the man down the front. You're saying that it's what Scotland's going to lose. But can the rest of the UK afford to lose 25% of their exports, which is whisky? Can it afford to drop, let us drop the pound, which means they're no longer a petrodollar currency, which is going to devalue the pound? I mean, we've been always told what it's going to cost us. Why can't we turn it around and hear what it's going to cost everyone else, instead of always focusing on what's, what we're going to lose? What's the rest of Britain going to lose, losing us? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Keith Brown, just to come back to the points that Jenny Mara was making, I mean, she is suggesting that, that you have failed to, to consider the full economic implications of independence, that there would be significant problems and that it's all very well saying it should be about more than that, but actually people need to know that they'll have the, have the money coming in. Well, I think the point, the very good question which Mr Stoddart put is a serious question. I think partially agree with Jenny. I think the economics are very important. And let's think about some of the economics just now. We are £1.4 trillion in debt with the UK. We're going to spend £4 billion a year on nuclear weapons with the UK. We have five people in the UK that have the same wealth as 12 million people, one of the most unequal societies in the world. That's what we're ditching with the UK. I think that's really important to remember. But the second point, the second point, the second point of the is this. The second point, to come back, I think, to the, 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 the crux of Mr Stoddart's question, which is it's got to be about more than that, and it is. It's partly about making a fair society and a real aspiration to improve our society, and which always amazes me with the no side is the anger they have when we express their aspirations. It always surprises me. But we saw a little clip before of the, um, of, of the history of Sky and the clearances. That's what happens when you're powerless. 
I'm not saying we're in that situation just now, but when you cede power to somebody else, they'll exercise that power in their interest, not in your interest. And more than anything else, the referendum and independence is about taking power back for ourselves. Okay, Jenny Mara. Thank you. Jenny Mara, and then I'll come to you. I think you're suggesting there that if people vote for independence, then Scotland will be a much more equal country. I just don't buy that argument. We, can we, are, we are campaigning for progressive policies across the United Kingdom. You know, Alex them. Salmond does not have any clear plan that I have seen, not in the white paper or anywhere else, to reduce inequality in this, in this country. Should it was only a couple of weeks ago that you voted against our amendment to put the living wage uh, through but Parliament. The only... Yeah, the only the only tax commitment that Alex Salmond has made in the white paper is to reduce corporation tax. He hasn't made any tax commitment for any working people or for anyone else. It is the only, for big business, it is the only commitment he has made. Yeah, John Ball, then I'll come to you, David. The, gen can I just say, the gentleman there was absolutely correct. The biggest single question in this country is inequality. It has got worse. Could I tell you that, in, that the, the percentage of wealth owned by the top 10% has actually not declined since 1910? What does that, when I campaigned 16 years ago for the, uh, for, the, for the minimum wage, I meant it to be a floor and not a ceiling. And what has happened since then is companies, and I'm a businessman, so I know what I'm talking about, companies have increased their profits and the take of capital has reduced. And what we have to do is reintroduce a social agenda whereby what I would call the living wage, which may be, say, £10 or more, is introduced progressively over a number of years. And and I'll just take one other point, and the way briefly, you would do briefly, that practically is to offer some tax incentives to those companies that pay a high percentage of their employees a living wage, and you would give them the, and the great advantage of that is that the parasites, the apples and the Starbucks and the Amazons and all those people that pay that do not pay tax wouldn't get any. Okay, what we, and that would never be achieved. That would never ever be achieved in a, a single Scotland. The government, the UK government, need to have the clout to take on Apple John, where there's £11 billion pounds of sales. John we Boyle. need clout to get economic reforms here. And your question is right. It will not be done well. In, in a small Scotland, it will be done much better in a unified All right. UK. OK, thank you very much. We've got the point. <laughs> D D David Heyman's been uh, itching to come back in on that for a while. Yeah, I would just love to pick up Jenny on a point. She said the Labour Party are trying to spread progressive policies about the United Kingdom, uh, throughout the United Kingdom. Where were those progressive policies when they were in power for 13 years? <laughs> and, uh, rather... Rather than allow give all power to the banks, one of the first things Gordon Brown did was give uh, the setting of the, of the uh, interest rate to the Bank of England. The last piece of power the British government had, they gave to the bankers. The rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and we've been into half a dozen illegal, unjust, immoral wars. And can I pick up on what that half lady... Half a dozen? I, well, in my, in my view, they were uh, uh, unjust and immoral. Which, yeah. which half uh, a dozen? Blair's Wars. Which half a dozen? Uh, Af Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Sierra Leone. Uh, the, it's the just that I'm interested that you, you lump them all together, that, that you would say the peacekeeping effort in Sierra Leone would be for you the same as invading Iraq. I think we've got to stop being an empire, James. We are, we are suffering under the yoke of empire. We are no longer an empire. OK, thank you. Thank and, you. And, 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 yet we, and yet we have just spent £6 billion building a mega aircraft carrier we don't even have aircraft for. Oh, now, that is, that is not for fisheries protection around these coasts. <laughs> That's for waging imperialistic wars around the world. And I do believe that people of Scotland do not want it. I'm going to just come to the man, yes, at the back. Yes, sir. With the beard. Yep, and the white yeah, we've top. We've both got beards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let, well whichever one with a beard would like to speak first. I think, I think one of the things that worries us up here in the northwest of Scotland is having seen the SNP for a couple of years in power, essentially, in Scotland, are we going to trade one Westminster quangle for another Holyrood quangle, really, that hasn't maybe the passion and, and the knowledge of the northwest that we really okay. yearn uh, up we'll, here? We'll try, just try and stick for now, if we can, just on the, on the broad theme, which is why are people so focused on the financial effects? Is that all people care about? If anyone has a point to contribute on that, please do put your hands up, stick your hands up, whatever side of the debate. Yes, please, sir. <laughs> Jenny, if I can pick up on a point you said about financing and the costings of independence and how there's nothing ever come forward, how can the Parliament at Holyrood 
finance or work out the costings, because at this stage, even on the 19th of September, if we go yes, we do not know what we will owe, what we own, and what our share of it is going to be. So you can't possibly work out where the finance is going to be coming from, where it's going to be spent, when we don't know what we've got or where it's coming from. OK, a brief, brief response from Jenny, who, cause, as you asked her, and then we'll, I think we'll move quickly on Jenny. Well, sir, there have been several independent financial analyses done of the likely impact of independence, and, and all of them have drawn question marks over the strength of our economy. Um, it, the only one that has a positive outlook is the Scottish Government's own one, which is, is biased in itself for independence. So I think we need to look to the financial experts and the independent reports on this. Keith Brown. I think at the very least we should acknowledge, as uh, one of your ex-party leaders has done, that Scotland could be a prosperous and viable country. Even the Permanent Secretary at the Treasury has said the same thing. So most people disagree with Jenny's uh, estimate that Scotland is going to be worse off. But to go back to the previous point, it was the SNP government which introduced a living wage for its employees, something the Labour Party had never done when it had the chance 13 years in power, either in Scotland or in the rest of the UK. It was the SNP that introduced and have kept free prescriptions, that have saved Safeguard a concessionary travel for our pensioners. The only threat to that, as we found it this week, is from the Labour Party. And the gentleman was quite right. The betrayals of the Labour Party to working people in Scotland over years is something that people won't forget when they go into polling booths on 18th September. Keith Brown, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd just like to remind you, you can join tonight's debate on Twitter using the BBC IndyRef hashtag, or you can text us on 80295. You can also email us at referendumdebate at bbc.co.uk. And you can go to the BBC Scotland News website to see a selection of your comments. And if you want to come along to a future programme, we'll be in Inverness on the 12th of August, Edinburgh on the 26th, followed by Aberdeen and then Stirling in September to apply to join the audience. And please do, if you'd like to, just search the internet for BBC Referendum Debate. Now, though, let's get back to the questions. Let's move on with the next question, which comes from Cameron Tallach. Is pressure that's being put on Scottish businesses to remain neutral in the re referendum and the independence debate tacit acknowledgement that independence would in fact be harmful to business? So it, it, your contention is that pressure is being put on businesses? It is reported so. OK, well, let's ask Keith Brown about that. It is reported so, but when you look at the reports of that, you'll find there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever. That's what's been found out when these allegations have been made. So even the most uh, recent one, which I think was the Scotch Whiskey Association, uh, the same person had said, I think, uh, very recently to a different committee that there, had, there was no evidence of that previously. So I think when these claims are made, given we're in a fairly febrile situation with the referendum, it's as well to look at the evidence behind it. It's well, well hang on, hang on. Let, let's just look at that. Gavin Hewitt, former chief executive of the Scotch Whiskey Association, who's come out in favour of the, the no campaign. He said, the SNP have regularly tried to get the message to the Scotch Whisky Association that the Scotch whisky industry should stay out of the independence debate. Are you calling him a liar? Uh, well, I, I've just said that he'd previously given evidence to the contrary before that. But so let's you are calling let's, him a liar? Let's, he's I've saying just, he's making this no, stuff I've, I've up. Said, I've said, which is that he said something very different shortly before that. But the important point is, if you think about the Scotch Whisky Association just now and the idea that somehow they're being bullied, this is the organisation which has taken the Scottish Government to court through the European uh, courts in relation to a uh, minimum pricing of alcohol. This this is not an industry which is a shrinking violet, can't get involved in a dialogue and debate. And really, it's incumbent upon people like that to actually give examples, say what's happened, if it's happened. And what we've not had is that so far. And what we also see is an organisation like Business for Scotland, representing thousands of businesses in Scotland, involved in that very constructive debate. I've never put pressure on anybody, business or otherwise. Has anyone... Although I do have discussions with people in businesses. Has anyone put pressure on you, John Boyle? Um, I have to be honest, no, they haven't. Um, I don't think that we should let this debate get into the tittle-tattle of who said what about whom. Unquestionably, um, uh, and I spoke at, a, uh, I, I spoke at a, a, a quite a large debate in Edinburgh recently, and I was surprised by the lack of questions. Certainly what I do know is that a large number of businesses are sitting on their hands. They don't want to commit, although they believe that being in the United Kingdom is the better path because they fear there may be recriminations after the event, even if the government, even if we vote no, because by definition any government, not just the Scottish Nationals, I'm not accusing them in any way of being vindictive, will be handing out government contracts and favours. And a lot of businesses in Scotland 
I definitely know, are certainly sitting on their hands. Uh, I, I have not been in any way pressurised at all. Our businesses are in... <clears throat> Uh, we have factories in the south of England and we have um, leisure f uh, businesses in Scotland. So um, uh, we're, all, we're all over the place. I don't think anybody would w wish to probably pressurise me, <laughs> but, I but I can say there's been a bit of a reluctance because I think people are concerned that when this is all over, they may feel the backlash. Well, let me come back to Cameron Tallock, who asked the question. What, what's your view? I was keen on independence. <laughs> And the more I get nearer to the referendum uh, vote, the more uncertain I become. And I'm at present uncertain okay. as to which way I'll vote. Well, let's put some of that to David Heyman then. Um, David Heyman, is there a concern here? Businesses are worried, aren't they? Isn't John Ball, is he right? Uh, yes, I'm sure some businesses are worried, just as uh, many, many businesses are uh, fully confident about an independent Scotland. Um, if, if those reports are right, that's really, really unfortunate. But I wouldn't like to talk about bullying. There is certainly a great deal of pressure going on. I mean, in the No campaign, you know, David Cameron has rolled in uh, Vladimir Putin, Barack Obama, um, Hillary Clinton, <laughs> Manuel Barroso from the European Union. I mean, they're lining up all their pals. Now, that pressure, now, I'm not calling it bullying, but that is pressure from very, very powerful people. And I think it's, I suppose it's justified on both sides to bring you know, what pressure you can to bear on the other. But I certainly hope the reports are wrong. Do, do you think these reports are wrong, Jenny Manor? I think there's been a culture over the last few months during this independence debate that if business or organisations in the country are not prepared to come out and support independence, they are very much encouraged by the Scottish Government, by the SNP, to take a position of neutrality. You only have to look at the Scottish universities. University of Scotland has taken a position of neutrality. Now, a lot of academics, I would say the vast majority of academics in our universities are very concerned about the research funding, cross-border student flows and all of these things that are going to affect our universities. But University of Scotland has taken this position of silence and neutrality. And last night was very interesting because key business people, Bertie Armstrong from the Scottish Fishermen's Federation and Gavin Hewitt from the Scottish Whiskey Association said, actually what I've been hearing locally for months, that business people are scared to speak out, not just because of their customers, but also that some SNP councillors might not pass their planning applications. Oh, that's and, well, that's, that's, what I, that's what I've been hearing, Keith. This is a usual that smear is, campaign from no, the campaign. No, that it's is what I've been hearing. I'm reporting, to you, I'm reporting to you what people are oh. telling me. Okay? And Are you calling Jerry is... Mara a liar? I'm saying that's not true. Well, <laughs> provide the evidence. You know of an SNP council that's threatened not to award a contract if somebody votes uh, I yes. am telling you that or businesses no. in Scotland fear to speak out because of the consequences. And there is that, there is that um, atmosphere around the campaign, and I think dispatches um, proved it very well last night. Okay, well, we've, we've got, we've got plenty of people willing to speak very quickly, if you don't mind. Just on a personal level, it happens in many, many ways. I've commissioned a one-man play for the Edinburgh Festival that I'm currently rehearsing, which is about the referendum. It's about is this, this a debate. plug? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> But, and I'm touring Scotland with it right up until the 17th, the night before the referendum, hopefully to change minds in terms of yes, uh, so that people will vote uh, yes. Several councils who run their theatres have not allowed my play to be performed there. So, just because I exercise my right to free speech, I'm being denied my right uh, of employment. And also STV, who annually do a... <coughs> A, uh, a charity uh, to discover local heroes. None of us who are involved in any either side of the debate can take part in that programme. But, but isn't no, that to try to ridiculous. protect their impartiality and maybe the same for some of the for some of the councils? Is that not what they're trying to do? No, but should it, the arts is it, where you creatively express the divergent opinions SGB, in, 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 in society. I'm on the panel of the local heroes, and, and I was I'm the chairman of the panel, and the STV most certainly invited me, and I'm and I'm going to the function in September. So the suggestion that STV have banned me, or they may have banned you, but they certainly <laughs> haven't banned me, <laughs> oh, because, because I'm the chairman of it. All right, thank you. You've got a much uh, higher profile uh, than I uh, have. Let, let, let's go. Uh, let's go just to the back of the room, and the women in black, yes. Um, I consider uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the globally interdependent United Kingdom, to be the backbone of Britain. My concern is that if that backbone is severed through Scotland um, getting independence, 
and there that ends up in chaos and uh, total destruction of okay. the United Kingdom infrastructure. Who is going to pick up the pieces and pay the cost? Okay, thank you very much. Down the front. Yes. I would say that even people in the media and you know celebrities and stuff like that would be scared of making their opinion present. Even Andy Murray, for example, getting tons of you know nasty comments and things like that just because of what he thinks. And you know, I think that's a problem: is that you're not allowed your own opinion if you're in the media, really. But going for independence, yeah, man, surely means that we have to be courageous on an individual level and on a collective level. If we're going for independence, we have to look, we have to dig deep inside ourselves for the courage to make it happen. David, and that we means have to dig deep, deep inside it. ourselves and for the courage to resist it. OK, thank you. Let's leave, it, let's leave that for the moment. I want to go to the next question, which is from Keith McKenzie. Keith McKenzie. What prize is independence from Westminster if it is replaced by the centralisation of powers to Edinburgh? OK, David Heyman. Um, I, I don't agree with the centralisation of powers. I mean, I'm one for devolved power. I mean, I think cities and towns should have their own... Uh, the, the right to, to run their own services uh, for, the, for the benefits and, and uh, on behalf of their people. I don't like centralisation of any kind whatsoever. I think one of the biggest mistakes that uh, the SNP government have made have created, is in creating Police Scotland. Now, that's where you can take... You can take policemen from Inverness and ship them to Edinburgh, from Glasgow to, uh, to, to Edinburgh, from Aberdeen to Ochtermuchty. We're talking about almost different cultures here and different local sensibilities, and I think that's a, a prime example. Now, in terms of procurement, I realise it, uh, it makes complete sense to have a police Scotland, but not in terms uh, of, of how you police your local okay, area. Okay, I'd, and so I'm, I'm all for devolution of power. Very interested to hear people's opinion here on Sky about this issue, about centralisation versus devolution of powers locally. So put your hands up if you want to contribute. In the meantime, Jenny Mara. I think, I mean, it's one of the principles of the European Union that the power is exercised at the most appropriate level. And I think we've got powers at EU, Westminster, Holyrood, local authority. And it's always a matter of balancing these powers. I don't think separating and drawing that line you know, between England and Scotland is the way to do it. But I think we all must, always must be looking at the balance of where that power is best exercised. And that's why um, the, um, the, the parties, apart from the SNP, have put forward um, their, their proposals. Labour put forward its devolution commission proposals in March. And one of the proposals we have is to devolve more powers from the Scottish Parliament and from Westminster, actually, um, to local authorities over control of the foreshore and renewables industry. So it's always keeping abreast of what's going on in the economy and balancing the powers to match it. OK, um, the man in the stripy top, yeah. Um, I think we need to, because the Highland Council is too big, it needs to be broken up further to say Sky and Loch Elsh, and oh. that be given powers. And, and how does, how, what relevance does the independence debate have, if any, to that for you? Because it's, we could have that being part of the UK and that being part of Europe, or we could have that as being part of Scotland be part of Europe. You're not getting us any further forward. <laughs> I'm undecided. <laughs> All right, I'll come to you in just a second, but I want to go to the women at the front here, yes. In some ways, my point is similar to the, the gentleman that's, that's just made a point. It's not about centralisation of power in Edinburgh. It's about centralisation of power in Inverness. It's about taking power away from local communities. What's the solution for you? The solution is to focus more for, for the, the powers that exist just now to demonstrate to us that they, they trust the local communities, that they're not just going to ignore what local communities think. And in a word, is that more or less likely to happen if Scotland's independent for you? <laughs> um, that's, it's tricky because I, I am generally in favour of independence, but I worry that we do just end up with power centralised in Inverness. All right, thank you very much. There are, there are certain functions of government that are better done large. Things like defence, things like overall social security policy, things like macroeconomic policy, things like... All of these things are more efficiently, more effectively done. 
And certain things are done better on a local basis. Some might say, and I, I detect uh, here, that too much power is held in Edinburgh and it should be devolved even further. So I think, I, I think you have got to get the balance. But there can be no doubt that on a UK basis, when we're negotiating with Europe, when we are negotiating with NATO, when we are doing the big things, when we are trying to set huge fiscal uh, issues, all of those things are much better done by a stronger, more competent, larger, more powerful government, of which we are a crucial part. And that is the core of it. Scotland is better in the UK. Uh, it's influential in the UK. And when it comes to these big things, it can help. That does not mean that we can't get um, more decision-making on Sky and less away from Edinburgh. Keith Brown... There does seem to be something of a feeling here, and also we heard this in Orkney as well when we were in Orkney a few weeks ago, that, that your government has drawn more powers into the centre in Edinburgh and that that might get worse if Scotland became independent. Yeah, and I can understand the point that if you were to replace one very centralised, and the UK is an incredibly centralised country, it's like France, a unitary state in that sense as well, um, and you replace that with another part uh, of the country which is uh, equally centralist, then you're not going to gain from that. I understand that. And I think, that, I think it was a lady that mentioned the word trust, and that's really important. Whether it's local authorities trusting local communities much more and saying, let's cede the powers here and say, you, you're best place to take these powers, or whether it's the central government in Edinburgh saying, no, let's it to, to local government and give them more power. And I think everybody that's trying to answer this question realises there are some grey areas here. Can I answer the point though about Police Scotland? I don't think it makes any kind of sense to have eight chief constables, a retinue, a huge number of assistant chief constables, eight your headquarters functions, all of which are paid for at the expense of frontline policing. So that's why I think that made sense. And by and large, the same police officers will be working in the same communities. There will be more resources for frontline policing. But just on the crucial point about where power rests, which again I think is what we're talking about, my view is that in, in independent Scotland, we've got the chance to write a constitution which puts into law, fundamental law, the role of local government. And don't forget the SNP government was the first government under the Concordat to say we will not ring fence local government money anymore. It will go to the purposes which local government wants, even though I recognise that some people here would want to see that taken a step further. I, mean, I know Highland Council do have a system, I think, of area committees, and obviously there's some dissatisfaction being expressed here with that. Okay, I think you should try local people as much as possible. But the Labour Party, of course, supported what we did with the police and many other things, although they like to criticise at the same time as well. That's Over interesting. You, would you give back to local authorities the power to set their own council tax? Uh, well, we, we give them, they have that power just now. No. I think that's the big mistake that John's, Jenny makes. You, you've put uh, a council tax freeze for many years. John Swinney yeah. fought the last I, election on the basis the, that there would be a council question? tax freeze the across Scotland. Answer yeah. the question. The simple fact is, it's up to each individual council. I used to be a council leader, I understand this point of law. Each individual council can choose to set the council tax. In my area, the council tax had gone up between 60 and 70 per cent in the time under the Labour Council when I was there, and people had had enough. So what we say just now is we'll give you the money to keep the council tax freeze. If you don't want to do that, if you want to increase your council tax, councils have still got the legal ability to do that, but they won't get additional money to help them freeze it if they're going to increase it. And I think that's the right thing. And I think people across Scotland are very grateful for the council tax freeze. Let's take a few points and we'll start with the man in the check shirt in, in the middle. Yes, thanks. No, I, I think the big issues are important, but at the same time, when you look at Westminster at the moment over the UKIP scenario, for example, day-to-day -day politics have been dominated just by the whole implosion of Westminster and, and they're wishing to appease all the, the UKIP supporters. OK, thank you. We'll come down the front here. Yeah, Mr Boy, you're saying bigger is better. Social Security, universal credit, complete mess. The Euro thing with the President of the European Union, David Cameron, made a complete mess of that as well. Bigger isn't better. NATO, Ukraine, we've made a mess of that as well. Look at the states there. Iraq, look at the mess it's in. Libya, look at the mess it's in. Everything we've touched, we've ruined. So bigger is not better. We're better sitting back and concentrating in Scotland and making our country big and strong and forget other countries. <laughs> I 
am in no way defending every decision that David, Cam David Cameron's taken. I personally think that he had to stand up against, a, uh, my personal opinion, he had to take a very strong stance against uh, a more federal Europe. That, that's what people voted for. He was doing his job. He's using his influence to make, to draw a line in the sand. And I think that is absolutely correct. So I fundamentally disagree with you on, on that issue. Uh, some of the other issues you, you mentioned, um, it's, it's a matter of every concern. But I do not think that a small, isolated Scotland, if it's trying to influence world affairs, will, would be as effective as a strong, unified United Kingdom. It's been doing that. We've, we've waged successful wars for 300 years. The Second World War was, was all, of the, all of this country coming together to, against uh, okay. absolute defined evil. Right. That's an example. David Heyman. <laughs> I actually disagree with John when he says that Scotland has an influence in the UK. We live with a democratic deficit. We are about 10% of the population of the United Kingdom. We are consistently outvoted. Our votes do not matter a jot in terms of Westminster. <coughs> we have never had proper democratic representation. And I don't think there's been, I think there's maybe only been one or two governments since the Second World War where Scottish votes have made any difference whatsoever. We'll come to the women. Excuse, 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 excuse me, can I just say something? Excuse Quickly, me. Yeah. And now, Scotland's influence in UK politics has been enormous. Um, David Steele, Robin Cook, Malcolm Rifkin, John Smith, Gordon Brown, Charles Kennedy, John Reid, Alistair Darling. Those people have been the centre of UK government. The last three Lord Chancellors, bar one, maybe, have maybe all that's come from not Scotland. Too well, John, because we have of punched influence. our weight and <laughs> influence, David, in, in UK I, affairs. Punched our weight the enormously. Of, the people of Scotland have no political voice, John, in terms of Westminster. We don't. The woman right at the back. The woman right at the back. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to remind, especially Jenny, that this is not about Alex Salmond. It is not about the SNP. <laughs> future of our country and exactly what David said, we have no voice. But there are 59 MPs in Scotland sitting in Westminster, there are 139 in London alone. What chance do we have? We will have elections in 2016, then we will pick the government that we want. If we don't want centralisation, we will have the opportunity to Thank vote you. for that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to respond to uh, John's point about um, Scotland punching its weight in the UK and in the world and ask why do we want to, why don't we solve our own problems okay. in our own Thank backyard you. And we'll come to the woman right in the middle, the woman right in the middle of the audience, the, the, the woman in the lilac. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say I do believe that Scotland is better off as part of the UK. People keep saying that um, a Scottish government will be closer to the issues that Scottish people are interested in. In Britain, the Britons don't think that about the politicians in Westminster. Why should it be any different in Scotland? Politicians are the same all over the world. OK, thank you. The point was raised was about competence, um, and I think the gentleman here gives a number of examples. We were not exactly enjoying competence. Bigger is better. Well, not in relation to a £1.4 trillion national debt. That's not better when it's bigger than that. But on the issue of competence, and I understand John's point, David Carman took a principal position, but how effective, how competent was he? I mean, John says that Scotland's going to be isolated. David Cameron lost that vote 26 to 2, only Hungary supporting. I think Scotland's a lot of friends in the world, and we can communicate with them directly and create a much better impression of Scotland than as being as a part of the UK. We don't want to be associated with illegal wars in Iraq. We don't want to be part of the nuclear club. We can create a much better um, situation for ourselves. And the idea of competence, all I would say is, I believe, it's my view, and it, obviously it's open to challenge, I believe that we have, in Scotland, been a competent government. I think even the previous administrations were more more competent than previous Westminster administrations, and that level of competence and experience that we have can be taken forward into other areas. So, for example, you know, a three billion pound pair of aircraft carriers becoming a six billion pound pair of aircraft carriers without, as David says, any planes to go on them, one to be mothballed as soon as it's built. That is extremely costly when you think about the number of people using food banks in this country. What we could use that money for instead. Okay. <laughs> The point the gentleman made, it's okay being um, small, but we have to engage with the international community. 
when the, the new Scotland, if it emerges, we don't know which currency is going to have, therefore we don't know which interest rate we're going to pay, we don't know what we're joined and what we're not joining, and th it is totally naive to suggest that you can sit in splendid isolation when you can't even control your financial affairs. Let me take a couple of points. The woman here, yes. It's easy to no, say... No, no, behind you, behind you, sir, and then I'll come to you. It's easy to say that we don't need nuclear and all that. What's going to happen if there is an actual world war again? We're talking exactly as was talked before the Second World War when we were disarming. We've got to think about the big picture. We could easily have Russia attacking us or any other country. And for you, should, and should we remain part of the United Kingdom to do we, so? Absolutely. In, in, in numbers, there is strength. In, okay. Tiny numbers, there is no strength. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on. And we are going to... Our next question we are going to is from Robbie Dempsey. Robbie Dempsey. Would an independent Scotland be better placed to tackle poverty and inequality? John Boyle. <clears throat> if I could allude to the point I made, absolutely not. The biggest question, as I said earlier on, was the question of inequality. It has not moved one jot. And the capitalist system has got a lot wrong with it. There's been an illusion brushed across that the last current recession was a blip. It wasn't. Inequality was continued to go down and down and down. And if we're going to attack inequality, and I made a, quite a practical suggestion that we should more or less mandate companies over a period of time to move towards a £10 minimum wage. That can only be done when we take on these big companies, these global companies, and we take them on head on. Okay. Apple, if Apple are ever okay. going to pay taxes in this country, and they turned over £11 billion, paid £9 million in tax, if Apple are ever going to be frightened, they'll be frightened about losing £11 billion of British sales, not a few million of Scottish sales. Okay. Strength Economic strength to take on global conglomerates is much better when we are a strong, united, united kingdom. OK, we have, we have slightly touched on this already, so let's take a quick answer from each of the panel and then we'll move on to the next one. David Heyman. If government is about the humane and creative and progressive management of the resources of a country for the betterment and well-being of its people, then definitely in an independent Scotland with our priorities right and with ridding ourselves of weapons of mass destruction and the need to police this world, we can then put resources into eradicating poverty much faster and much more effectively than we can on a UK level. Okay, I firmly Je believe. Jenny Mara. Sorry, would yeah. an independent Scotland be better placed to tackle poverty and inequality? I don't think so. I don't think so because there would, there would not be the money to do it. There would be less money and all the independent economic analysis has said that and you need the money to do it. You know, the, the, just, the sums do not add up and also Jenny, the current government... Spend £6 billion the current... on a useless aircraft carrier, that's £6 billion that could go into David, eradicating poverty. David, Alexander has spent that money time and time again and to, on the point about nuclear weapons, if I can answer this, James, I firmly believe, and there are people in Yes Scotland agree with me, that if Scotland votes yes in September, Alex Salmond will go to the negotiating table with David Cameron and very soon um, the, the nuclear weapons issue will come off the table because he will want to secure the single currency and there are several other things he will want to secure and the nuclear oh. weapons issue will be pushed to the side. You know, Alex Salmond campaigned in 1993 for the Trident refit jobs to come to the Rossyth dockyards. Trident and nuclear weapons is a very convenient uh, political campaigning tool for Alex Salmond and that's what makes me really angry about this whole argument. <laughs> But the suggestion here is that, is that there simply isn't enough money for an independent Scotland and that you've spent the money you say you would say from Trident a dozen times over. Well, I think people know that's not the case. We contribute, over the last 33 years, Scotland's contributed more per head in tax to the UK than the rest of the UK. Scotland is a very wealthy country and the idea that we can't, we shouldn't, we're too wee, we're going to be too isolated. Would we in Scotland, if we were independent, have introduced a bedroom tax brought in by the Labour Party, kept by the Tory Party? We wouldn't have done that.
Uh, OK, it's all to do with to say. The other point is on the welfare cap, which both Labour and Tories have voted for, the welfare cap. What you're looking forward to, if it's a no vote, is four more years with public sector pay falling behind. We've heard that from the Tories. It's gone down by 16% uh, under the, uh, in the recession. Four more years of that kind of restriction on public sector wages. Four, at least maybe four, maybe eight, maybe ten years of austerity. We can go a different way. We can start to expand the economy. It will come down to a question of confidence and trust. Surely we can do better than the UK did, government did has done you, by did, so far. Did you say that Labour had introduced the bedroom tax? Yes, Labour. Lord Freud introduced the bedroom tax for private sector uh, properties. And also, sure, when sure they it had was the chance... No, it wasn't. No, no, it, wasn't. It, was, it was Labour that introduced... People are often shocked to hear that. Yeah, the Labour okay. Party introduced a bedroom tax. And also, when Westland okay. West had a chance to abolish it, the Labour Party never turned up in their numbers. They okay. voted down. Yeah. If the civil servants in Westminster put the bedroom tax proposal as it stands now before Alistair Darling when he was Chancellor, Lord Freud he it. rejected it straight Lord out. Freud David Cameron it. introduced it. Some of the biggest anti-poverty measures went through Westminster under Gordon Brown as Chancellor. The minimum wage, there was no SNP members in the lobby that night in the Lord House Freud of Commons. They were the in their tax. bed. Labour they weren't the there to tax. vote for the minimum Minimum wage. Right. So I will not take lessons from the SNP on any of these measures. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to our next question, which comes from Carol Ingalls. Carol Ingalls. Um, we're constantly told that an independent Scotland is a leap of faith. Um, I just wonder what certainties the panel think there are in staying in the union. Keith Brown. <laughs> hey. Well, I'm just going on what the UK politicians themselves have said. As I said, they're talking about years of austerity to come. I think they said 40% of the cuts that they expect to bring in have been brought in so far. So that's going to be the future. In terms of pensions, I mean, look at what we've got. The second, or one of the worst pensions in the whole of Europe just now. We've got that just now. I don't see any proposal coming from either of the parties that's going to change that. Uh, whether it's a welfare cap, as I've mentioned, both Labour supported the idea of the welfare cap with the Tories as well. So we can see where the pressure is going to come. I, I think John was spot on when he was talking talking about the likes of Amazon and Starbucks and not collecting the tax from these organisations. What I disagree with them on is that the failure of the UK is something that we'd replicate in Scotland. We could have a much simpler, much fairer uh, uh, system of taxation in Scotland. I agree, for example, in reducing corporation tax. I think Scotland and indeed other parts of the UK have to get an edge over London, the pool of London. Most, a lot of u unionist politicians are saying the same thing now, so we have to do that. But when you levy the tax, you've got to make sure you collect it. And the resources spent on benefit fraud, quite rightly by the UK government, massively dwarf the resources put into getting corporation tax back from the corporations which um, uh, try to avoid it. So I think it's really important you have a fair uh, taxation system. There, oh. there is some question, there is obviously a question, people are going to have to take some of this according to their best judgment because some of the facts are not there, not least because the UK government refuses to discuss or negotiate on these things before the referendum right. to better inform it. Okay, oh, the, 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 the assertion is is essentially, Jenny Mara, that the only certainty if Scotland remains in the Union is austerity. Well, the best paper I've seen recently to talk about the certainties of the UK was the SNP's white paper for independence. Because right through that white paper, it makes the case very clearly for all the advantages of the United Kingdom. Because in that white paper, Alex Salmond wants to keep the monarchy, the currency, the Bank of England, the National Lottery, the I can NHS, see this list. Blood it's very long. Don't read service, it all out. the Royal Mint, the Research <laughs> okay, Council, the Green Investment the Bank. That is the certainty. The SNP actually recognised, and yes, Scotland recognised, recognises a lot of these things. That's why they want to keep so much of it. OK, let's come to the, the woman in the front. I think really that when you're talking about power, you need to talk about power at a different kind of level from geographical or purely political power. And actually listen to what people are saying in terms of uh, abuses of power. We have an item in the news right now about child abuse. It's been happening over decades, about which nothing has been done. There are abuses happening in Scotland at the moment, and ordinary people try to speak to politicians about it. But as per the child abuse, which has happened for decades, and we know has been going on, uh, the politicians would rather listen to people of high status than they would to people who actually know what is going on. Now, that is across okay. the board. That is politicians in general. And I would like to see that change now, not merely wait until the referendum on, on the 18th of, of September. Thank you. The question was, what certainties are there if we stay in the union? The man, eh, eh, yes, there, sir. Everything's being done at the moment concerning taxation, corporation tax, Amazon not paying. But since none of the panel that are here this evening have any direct connection with the island of Skye, since 1997 we had Labour, or New Labour, or Blue Labour as it really should be called, then we've had the Tories, 
Since I arrived on the Isle of Skye to live here, thanks to Westminster governments and Westminster cuts, we now have a food bank on the Isle of Skye. And for that, the people of Skye are eternally grateful to Westminster and their cuts. John Boyle. If you are talking about economics, as we've now moved away from the passionate debate to the economic debate, the facts seem to be quite incontrovertible. How you can propose on an economic basis an independent Scotland which is going to be able to... We hear from the, um, the S campaign or the SNP, I'm not a politician so I'm entirely with you um, uh, on, on the, the, problem of the problems that politicians... What, 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 we, what we have is you want to spend, you want to spend on this, it gets an easy clap, spend, spend, spend. Where are you going to find the money? It simply isn't there. Um, it just isn't there. You want, you want free universities, free prescriptions, uh, you don't want any bedroom tax. Now, all of those, everybody would want that. Nobody wants, nobody wants to withdraw benefits if they're not there. But you are entering into an element of economic uncertainty. You won't know what your mortgage payment is going to be next week. You won't know what currency you'll be using. You, you will be in an economic doldrum that's unbelievable. The risk element of voting yes is quite unquantifiable, and we've had no figures. We don't even know what the start-up cost of the new Scotland is going to be. Even if it's a billion, even if it's half a billion, I don't know. All the probably 47 new institutions set up, the administration, the bureaucracy, talk about wasting money right. when you have to okay. buy a new civil aviation authority. Okay, thank you. Thank These you are very much. just some of the things. Yes. The risk is yes. enormous. You're talking about spend, 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 spend by the Scottish Government. We are in a time of severe austerity. There are massive cuts Correct. left, right, and I spend. Agree with you. Why, therefore, are we spending £130 billion on a weapon of mass destruction? £45 billion pounds on a vanity project so you can get from London to Manchester 15 minutes quicker than you can now. And why are we lashing out £60 billion pounds plus on infrastructure for London that's absolutely crawling with it anyway? Why? David, David, actually, David Hayman wants to come in on that point. I'd yeah, like David to the answer the woman who, who, who raised that question. I think if we stick with the UK, we will definitely be guaranteed uh, more austerity, more poverty, more food banks. The cuts that have been implemented so far are only 35% of the cuts still to come. But where's Scotland cuts... going to get all this money, David? Well, for a start, we will not be building, uh, have weapons of mass destruction. We will not be going, going into any ridiculous wars overseas. I mean, that's a massive is, is saving that's already. Do you think it can all be... Where's the rest of the money? I mean, Alex Hammond it's... hasn't made any... But, but any Jerry, time. listen, has, but, but people ask about anything. the money. Listen, you've got Jerry, to be Jerry, absolutely Jerry, clear. 60% of, Europe, of Europe's oil reservoirs uh, reserves are just off the coast of Scotland. We have the second largest gas reserves in Europe. We have potentially 25% of wind and tidal, tidal power in Scotland. We have an extremely vibrant uh, drinks and food industry. We have a biotechnology industry, uh, life sciences. David, Scotland e e e spends e more even, than it even, needs. Even, please let me finish. Even my industry, the creative industries, we turn over £5 billion a year. The island of Isla, that tiny little island off the west coast of Scotland with its half dozen distilleries, delivers to Westminster in tax almost £1 billion right. every year. Let, let, let's have Jenny Mara come uh, back on some of these points. I mean, David, Scotland spends more than it makes. We know that over the last 21 years, there's only been one year that we're not in deficit. I mean, John Swinney has, has said that all of this stuff is, is really fanciful and lovely. But actually, when you, you've got politics, is about hard choices. Of and it's about it reality choices as well. And all this stuff about the, the nuclear weapons disappearing from Scotland, I firmly believe that that is not going to happen under independence. And I've campaigned against nuclear weapons myself. But just to keep saying that we'll be a much better country because Trident will disappear and we'll have that portion of money to respect. It's much more complicated than that. Um, you know, where the so sums true. just simply don't add up. I want to take a couple of points from people who haven't spoken. So, first of all, the women here. Jenny, you keep saying that Scotland spends more than it makes, but Britain spends more than it makes, and it's spending it on the wrong things. Yep, yep. Okay, thank you. And... <laughs> yes, the man at the back. Yes. Also, I'd like to point out the Scots pay £800 per year in tax 
more than our southern neighbours. Okay, the man at the back. And you spend £1,200 per head more than our southern neighbours. You can't have it both ways, David. You just think because you're not going to build an aircraft carrier, you can then just say everything's going to be all right on the night. And by the way, tell that to the guys that are about to lose their jobs on Clyde's they side, because they, they, they are going the right on the door, because the British government will not build any more ships in Glasgow. And, and put it into far more peaceful and creative means rather than weapons of war. <laughs> Those right. skills will not be lost. This, this poor gentleman at the back has been waiting forever, sir. As Mr Boyle says, uh, we don't know what the mortgage rate is going to be. We actually don't know what mortgage lenders will lend in Scotland if we are a foreign country. OK, thank you. Let's get the not final the question of the evening. Final question, because time is rapidly running out, and it comes from Brian Clark. Brian Clark. Are the BBC biased in the referendum coverage? Are the BBC biased in the referendum coverage? Question for David Heyman. That's a really tricky one. <laughs> why, why are you all laughing? Trickier for me than it is for you, to be fair. It's far trickier for you. <laughs> um, I don't know that there's a bias. There is certainly not um, equal coverage. Let's see, I'm being very, very diplomatic here. In what um, way? In I, what way? I, 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 um, well, I, th I think the prominence given to the No campaign is far greater than that given to the Yes campaign and BBC News bulletins. I think that everybody would agree with that and most of the audience would. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yes, in that sense, would I'm Jenny, agreeing with Jenny Mara, would you agree with that? No, I don't. I, I, I actually... I don't, I don't see any major bias, and I also think, you know, that... The any B major the, the, bias or any bias? I don't see any bias. The BBC, the journalists I know are, are very good, and I think the BBC has an international reputation um, for impartial news coverage, and I would be very surprised if anyone but, in the BBC would want to jeopardise But the point that. is that the bias is supposed to be in your direction, so it's not in your interest to see it, really, is it? Well, perhaps, but I, I don't see it. OK. John Boy. And I think the BBC, and I'm not just saying here because I'm sitting as a guest of the BBC, the BBC have done, an, I think, an extraordinarily good job. They're taking debates all over the country. They've, they've put it front of a message. You can't turn on a news bulletin, but the referendum is well covered. So I think it'd be rather spurious for any side to blame the BBC of bias. I think they've handled it very well and continue to handle it very well. OK, the man here. BBC, I think, are looking to ask for a clap on the back. And I think we have to be very careful about giving them that, much as I would like to. But you're talking about the quality of information which we in the audience have to put up with. Prior to coming here, like most of the people sitting on this side of the, the studio, we've trolled through 11 major papers this weekend. Eight are absolutely negative about Scottish Government, about the referendum, and they're consistently hostile. What are we supposed to do trying to translate and interpret? the quality of that type of information. Thank you. Um, the man at the front. Uh, there was recently a protest sort of outside of BBC Scotland's headquarters in Glasgow, and people were complaining that the BBC were under-exaggerating how many people were there, yet tons of other sources were over-exaggerating it, yet nobody seemed to care that many other people were over-exaggerating. It seems as though just the Yes campaign shouting, oh, we are not being heard loud enough. OK, Keith Brown, do you support those protesters who are outside the BBC in the sense that do you agree with them that they have a point? Uh, well, can I say two things? First of all, I think we have to recognise I can't remember a time when there's been this level of scepticism about the BBC. Uh, you know, you see it on social media a great deal. You've seen it in the protests that you mentioned as well. I can't remember a time when it's been as widespread as that. However, I have to say, I think, like Jenny, I know and have met a number of BBC journalists who... I don't think they're working one side or the other trying to, to, to work the debate. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been sacked uh, or put to one side. Um, which is very unfortunate. Are you, are, you saying, are you saying they've been sacked for their political views? No, no. I think that there's been, there's, there has been cuts in the BBC. Actually, in the last discussion we were talking about... No, but that's interesting. I mean, if you're linking the two things, are, are you linking the two things or not? No, I've just said that there are, there are BBC journalists who I thought were very good journalists. Uh, some of the programmes, which you'll all know very well, suddenly the journalist has changed. And I think it's very unfortunate. One of the most exciting times in Scotland's political history, wherever you stand in the debate, the BBC are cutting back its resources. And the last thing to say on the resources, we were talking about that before, where's the money coming from? We contribute £320 million in Scotland to the BBC. They spend, if they spend that in itself, £175 million. We could get a lot more at the BBC that for independent. Absolute nonsense. 
not it's going up. Sorry, this that is, we, 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 are, we, are, we actually paid just under 10 per cent of the licence fee. And you get for to that. watch no, all no, the no, programmes. For that, yeah. we are given, the Scots are allowed 3 per cent of transmission time. And that, that is and that, nonsense. Unfortunately, is where we must leave it, because our hour is up here on the BBC. Next month we'll be in Inverness and Edinburgh, followed by Aberdeen and Stirling in September. To apply to join the audience, just search the internet for BBC referendum debate, which we will do our very best to ensure continues to be balanced. My thanks to our panel here this evening and to the audience as well. And from Portray on Sky, good night. BBC Radio Scotland is looking for audience members to join the big debate. You can apply for a ticket by emailing bigdebate at bbc.co.uk.